Dacia's Jogger aims to blend the sensible virtues of an estate car with the usefulness of a compact seven-seat MPV and the style of an SUV. All at affordable pricing that will see you doing a double take. It gets modern engineering tech too. You'd have thought that in today's market that just about every conceivable market niche would have been filled. Yet, in the rush to deliver every conceivable kind of SUV, one segment has been ignored. That for a truly affordable seven-seat family car. And who better to fill that niche than Dacia? If you want seven seats in a family car these days, even in a converted van, you'll need getting on for £30,000, which Dacia thinks is ridiculous. So the company has taken its Sandero hatchback and lengthened its platform enough to insert a third seating row, so creating this car, the Jogger. At the same time with this model, there are crossover-inspired looks, a world away from the dull conformity of the forgettable Dacia compact estate this contender effectively replaces the Logan MCV. The Jogger has even been engineered with the option of Dacia's first hybrid engine, though most customers will order it with a more conventional one-litre petrol unit we're trying today. Either way, Dacia claims that what's on offer here redefines what a seven-seat family car should be. Well, it certainly redefines what you might have expected to pay for one, at launch in late 2021, the base spec version of this model could be had from just £15,000. It's hard to get a new Super Mini for that these days. Yet, what you're getting here, according to the Romanian maker, is the spaciousness of an MPV, the practicality of an estate car, and the styling of an SUV. Quite a combination. So, how has Dacia done it? Well, as most people know, Dacias are basically Renaults with different styling and slightly lower quality trim, built in Eastern Europe with more affordable labour. The fact that this one is too is disguised here by the fact that the Renault version of this design, called the Tribeca, isn't sold in this country. Overall, it's a sensible approach to maximising value. But does it come with a catch or several? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. Time to drive the Dacia Jogger. So, what do we have here? Relatively big car, relatively small engine, platform stretched beyond the boundaries it was originally intended for, and the potential for every kind of engineering corner to be cut to achieve a super low price. It doesn't sound very promising, does it? Or so we thought going into this test, but this car is out to prove its doubters wrong in so many areas, and drive dynamics is just another of them. First of all, there's nothing wrong with stretching a small car platform to create something bigger. The Skoda Scala, the Peugeot 2008 and the Alfa Romeo Tonale are just a few of the current beneficiaries of that approach. Cars we're quite happy to recommend. Back at the end of 2020, we told you there wasn't much wrong with the current version of the Dacia Sandero either, which basically donates nearly all the engineering here. And the Renault design CMFB architecture it sits on, though in the case of the Jogger, the platform's been stretched by 30 centimetres. The engine we're trying in this car is the one-litre, three-cylinder TCE Renault petrol unit that Dacia seems to want to fit to almost everything it makes. We think a diesel would also work well with the kind of car this is, but there's no sign of that. What the Jogger will get is the interesting 1.6-litre full-hybrid petrol engine currently fitted to Renault's Clio and Capture models, which wasn't available at the time of this test, but might well be by the time you come to view this film. But the costly technology of that electrified unit will delete the very value proposition which will have tempted you to look at the Jogger in the first place. Less is more when it comes to the budget end of the market, otherwise you're kind of missing the point. And the point here is to deliver only what customers will actually need. Well, in a car weighing only a fraction over 1.2 tonnes, you certainly don't need a lot of front-end grunt. 
The 109 horsepower output of this one litre unit covers off the requirement perfectly, particularly when it's assisted by the eager little spinning turbo that cuts in rather over enthusiastically from just under 3000 RPM. And if you're quick with the rather clunky changes of the six speed manual gearbox, urges you on to 62 miles an hour in an entirely respectable 11.2 seconds. That stat's not particularly relevant because entirely appropriately, this engine's been tuned here more for mid-range pulling power than the traffic light Grand Prix. Here's a more telling set of figures, 200 newton meters of torque, enough to haul along 600 kilos of onboard passengers and cargo at the same time as towing a 1200 kilo braked trailer. If your carriage needs are greater than that, by all means find twice the price required for a jogger, up your running costs and go for a mid-sized seven-seat SUV instead. One of those would comfortably beat this statue's 114 mile an hour top speed. But when was the last time you drove over 114 miles an hour? But does it all fall apart when you reach the twisty stuff? Well, the steering is light and not particularly chatty, and the grip level from the cheapo tyres is somewhat modest. But the damping rates are well enough chosen to stop the car unduly rolling about through faster, tight turns without being so firm that progress down the high street will feel like tobogganing along on a tin tea tray. Speed humps and poorer potholes are nonetheless quite keenly felt, but the car feels quite at ease with them, which is suggestive of engineering designed to accommodate third world tarmac, as is indeed the case. This car's tried and trusted suspension layout, McPherson struts at the front and simple trailing arms at the back, works well with a stiff CMFB platform and delivers plenty of wheel travel, which must really help this car in rough road markets like Algeria and Bolivia. Here in Blighty, that light electrically powered steering is a boon when parking, of course, and facilitates an 11.7 meter curb to curb turning circle. And there's great all-round visibility for tight urban streets, courtesy of the glassy cabin. An eco button on the dash allows you to focus all of the car's systems on economy for town driving too. If most of your driving is going to be in city conditions, then it might be worth considering the hybrid model we mentioned earlier, which is the one you have to have to get auto transmission, a mandatory fitment for electrified joggers. This four-cylinder 1.6-litre 145 horsepower normally aspirated petrol unit is extremely compact and features two electric motors, one with 36 kilowatts on the rear of the gearbox and one with 15 kilowatts on top of the transmission. The motors get powered by a 1.2 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack located beneath the boot floor, while the rest of this rather bulky drivetrain has somehow to be shoehorned beneath the bonnet. Dacia expects the Jogger Hybrid to be able to run up to 80% of its time on electricity in urban driving. Whichever power plant you choose, you'll find that refinement isn't quite up to the standard we'd usually expect from a family car from one of the established makers, but it's not too far off. A lot of the noise there is comes down to wind and tyre roar or the odd buzz of loose interior trim, the sort of thing you inevitably get from a cheap car featuring lots of movable and removable fittings. It's not a deal breaker though, and there's cruise control and autonomous braking to aid your progress. The latter only a radar based system, which is why it can't recognize pedestrians and cyclists. Blind spot monitoring, usually an expensive option on family cars, is standardized here above base trim, which is surprising given that the more basic provision of a lane departure warning system is entirely ignored across the range. The blind spot system illuminates an LED light within the door mirror to warn you if another vehicle may be concealed from view. You might hope that this car's SUV visual vibe might be matched with a bit of light off-road prowess. Not four-wheel drive, there wouldn't be much point in that, but maybe some kind of simple traction control system for slippery surfaces, say the grip extend feature that Renault fits to its vans. 
There's nothing like that, but this car's 200 millimeter ground clearance figure and reinforced body structure means that a jogger might get surprisingly far up a gnarly track without damage. Maybe also in the depths of winter if you fitted it with an appropriate set of all-weather tyres. But jogger folk are unlikely to have a remote Lake District cottage or forested Highland hunting lodge in their property portfolios. They'll be wanting this car for camping holidays, fully loaded up trips to the dump and charabang work inviting the kids' friends home for tea all of which it will deal with easily. And when you finally drop them off and freed up a few hours for yourself, it won't embarrass you in the gym car park alongside all those pricey SUVs. In fact, when parking up, you might even permit yourself a feeling of quiet satisfaction. You haven't contributed to some wannabe brand's spiralling marketing budget. Instead, you've bought a car fit for purpose, yet one that, unlike previous statues, doesn't overly advertise how little you've paid for it. It's the first model from this Romanian brand that we could see ourselves owning, perhaps as a perfect second family car. Try one and you might well agree. So what exactly is this? Part station wagon, part crossover, part SUV, part MPV. Take your pick. What the jogger doesn't have is Dacia's usual whiff of budget brand about it. And it's all a world away from the stripped out Eastern European vibe of the dispiriting Logan MCV estate this car replaced. This is easily the longest model the Romanian company makes, measuring four and a half metres in length. Thanks to the 30 centimetre wheelbase increase, it enjoys over its Sandero hatch stablemate. You'll spot the visual SUV vibe here. 200 millimetres of ground clearance, modular roof bars and black wheel arch cladding see to that. And disguise the fact that from the B pillar forwards, everything is pretty much the same as a Sandero. There is, though, a 40 mm step up at the rear to offer the additional height and width needed for the extra seating row. All good, though this black strip across the lower panel work appears to have all the quality of a length of gaffer tape and might eventually come off just as easily. These modular jogger branded roof bars, standard above base trim, are interesting with the aid of an Allen key converting easily into an elegant lateral roof rack with an 80 kilo load capacity. The wheels are 16 inches across the range with steel rims at base level and black alloys with top spec. And this middle ranking comfort version gets these flex wheels with convincing alloy style covers, which if damaged, will be cheaper to replace than the real thing. The front gets a smart bonnet with twin creases either side and a bold wide grille flanked by Dacia's signature Y-shaped LED daytime running lights and headlamps with LED illumination, though only for the low beams. That grille doesn't do too much of the cooling, that function instead taken care of by this wider intake beneath, which has a square radar sensor for the autonomous braking system. Front fog lights below, smart little silver strips are standard, and this lower skid plate style piece of grey finishing aims to add to the crossover vibe. At the rear, it's square and bluff, as is necessary to make possible space for the third seating row. Vertical Dacia branded rear lights maximise the width of the tailgate and there's quite a substantial feeling of size, which makes it difficult to believe that this car rides on the same CMFB platform as a little Renault Clio Super Mini. A smaller shark style antenna is available as an alternative to this larger beasting style one. And you have to look for signs of cost cutting, but they're there, all right. The Romanian maker doesn't even stretch to proper badge work. Instead, the brand and model names are attached back here with stickers. So a smart look outside, but what about the cabin? Well, our comfort model's keyless entry system has automatically unlocked the door for us. So let's take a look inside. 
The front of cabin design here is shared with Dacia's very cheapest model, the Sandero hatchback, and news of that, together with knowledge of the amount of money being asked here, might lead you to expect all the interior charm of a Bulgarian thrift store. That's certainly what characterised earlier Dacia models sold in our market, like this model's Logan MCV predecessor. But gone are the old-fashioned hard slabby plastics and clumsy-looking flip-open air vents of that previous model. In contrast, what's served up by this jogger is surprisingly welcoming, thanks to quite a pleasing combination of materials and contemporary-looking dials and controls. Take, for instance, the way that this interior is lifted by this cross-hatched fabric trim across the centre of the dash and on the door armrests. Knurled silver trimming decorates the gear stick, and if you avoid base trim, you also get automatic air conditioning with these three smart silver bezel dials, which turn with a nicely damped, classy action. Also added from comfort level upwards is this soft feel stitched leather steering wheel along with a satin chrome finish for the door catches and these oblong vents. Only the unpleasantly shiny grained dash top finish and doors that have a rather insubstantial feel when they thunk shut give the budget brand game away. We're not going to get carried away here. You still probably wouldn't mistake this for the cabin of a cutting-edge modern Golf or Focus class estate, but it does at least now feel like one designed in the last decade rather than the last century. Well, it does, providing you avoid baseline essential trim anyway, where the jogger manages without any sort of mid-fascia central infotainment display, a media control centre dock provided instead, enabling your phone to be mounted so that its screen will perform the same function. It's a simple, smart way to bring in features that would otherwise increase the car's price, such as navigation, music streaming and hands-free calls and texts. We'd point out, though, that the cradle provided isn't big enough to accommodate plus-size phones. Behind that cradle is a handy USB port, thankfully of the old-school USB-A type, so you won't have to bother with converter leads for older handsets. The cradle and the USB port also feature on mid-range comfort models like this one, but instead work with this adjacent built-in 8-inch media display screen perched on top of the dashboard, with touch-sensitive buttons down the side and its homepage split into six icons that allow you to access major functions. This looks far more modern than the sort of thing you got even on top versions of the previous Logan MCV. This upgrade also gets you a better DAB audio system with six speakers in place of the rather stingy two provided on essential models and you'll be pleased to find that this monitor features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone integration, though that won't work wirelessly unless you stretch to top Extreme SE trim, where the screen also gains built-in navigation. Unfortunately, it's rather over-bright at night when you have to fiddle about with screen menus to darken it, but it usefully illuminates with time, temperature and date when you first get into the car. Thanks to the raised ride height we mentioned earlier, you sit a fraction higher than the family hatch norm. And looking forwards, the instruments are simple. There's a pair of traditional dials for revs and speed, which are quite elegant, plus a central black and white display that gives you a choice of vehicle and data options you can scroll through using these buttons on the steering wheel. The vehicle section has a digital speedo and engine temperature info. The data section provides average and current MPG readouts, driving range, your distance travelled, average speed and an odometer. Getting comfortable is much less of a challenge than it was on older Dacias, which had questionable ergonomics and limited steering wheel adjustment. Here, everything falls to hand easily and there's both reach and rake steering wheel adjustment. Unfortunately, the fold-down armrest you can have in a Sandero isn't carried forward here, nor is it possible to specify an Isofix child seat fastening for the front passenger seat, and lumbar support for both the front chairs is missing across the range, which is disappointing because they're sculpted somewhat flatly, which is something you'll notice on the few occasions you choose to drive your jogger on really long journeys. 
On the plus side, visibility is very good with reasonably thin A-pillars and a deep glass house. The view behind and over the shoulder is also good thanks to the glassy cabin, but just in case, above entry-level trim, Dacia provides a rear camera, rear parking sensors and even blind spot assistance. We'll finish up front here by checking out cabin storage. Dacia says there's 24 litres of it dotted about, which seems believable. There are two cup holders ahead of a small lidded armrest cubby. And ahead of the silver gear lever, there's a stowage area at the base of the centre stack with a 12 volt socket. Those small items you put here are going to slide about. We wish the USB slot was sighted down here too, rather than further up next to the screen so that it can support the phone cradle. Dacia boasts of a generously sized 7-litre glove box, but it turns out to be nothing of the sort. Compromised for right-hand drive models, as in all other Renault-based designs, by an encroaching fuse box. Still, the door pockets are big, large enough to take a 1-litre drinks bottle. And there are also ticket clips in both sun visors. Right, let's take a look at the middle row. Now, the door opens nice and wide. And because of this jogger's boxy shape, it'll be easy for parents to lean in and attach bolster cushions or child seats. For those above school age, though, you might worry about space for knees and legs back here, given that a car based on a super mini platform has here somehow to accommodate three seating rows. Inside, though, it's actually not too bad. That lengthened 2.9 metre wheelbase has definitely paid dividends. Even tall, lanky folk can fit in quite easily, and there's plenty of space for feet to slide underneath the bottom of the front seats. Unfortunately, the rear bench back here can't slide or recline as it would in an MPV, nor does it have an armrest, but it is sculpted so that a middle occupant can sit in reasonable comfort. That's something complemented by the low height of the center transmission tunnel, above which is a 12 volt socket. You'd have thought in this day and age that a USB port would have been more use. The cabin width though is impressive. This car is 138 millimeters narrower than a comparable seven seat SUV like a Skoda Kodiak, but it certainly doesn't feel it. Unlike in a Sandero, you get an overhead light and big door pockets on both sides. And top Extreme SE variants even get tray tables folding out of the front seat backs. Across the range, those seat backs have pockets, plus there are coin recesses in the doors, coat hooks in the overhead grab handles, and ISOFIX child seat fastening points for the two outer seating positions. What about the third row? Well, to access it, you pull on this seat shoulder tie, then lift the light seat base forward, freeing up a surprisingly wide aperture for entry to the very rearmost part of the car. Granny should certainly be able to manage this on her Sunday afternoon jaunt to the garden center. Once you're ensconced in the third row, there are more surprises. No, as an adult, you wouldn't want to be relegated back here for really long trips, but you could just about cope with a medium length jaunt in this part of the car if you had to. The 127 millimeter knee room figure is also better than you get in a mid-sized seven seat SUV like a Skoda Kodiak or a Land Rover Discovery Sport. And thanks to the jogger's boxy shape, there's more headroom too, measured at 855 millimeters. It doesn't feel as claustrophobic in the back of this Dacia than it would do in those cars either, thanks to these large rear side windows and the fact that they have the angled opening mechanism you don't usually get on a seven seat car. It's annoying that there are no ISOFIX child seat fastenings back here, though that's a mistake many seven-seaters make. And it'd be helpful if this light on the left could be switched on. It's the boot light and it only reacts to the tailgate. Plus, again, Dacia seems to be rooted in the last decade in its provision of a 12-volt socket here on the left instead of a USB port. But many much pricier seven-seat rivals don't provide anything to plug devices into at all. Dacia's also favoured occupants back here with wide armrests and single cup holders on both sides. Finally, let's take a look at the boot. Now, lift the light tailgate and with all three 
seating rows in place. Capacity is predictably limited, though 213 litres should still be enough for a quick supermarket visit. There's no more space beneath the cargo base and it doesn't do to try and pry beneath the carpet as if you do, all the rather cheap sound insulation felt starts coming out as here. Some sort of underfloor storage would have been helpful as without it there's nowhere to put the tonneau cover when it's not in use so you'll need to leave it at home cluttering up the garage as when in place it'll bar entry and exit from the very back of the car. The jack can't live beneath the floor either, it's in this left-hand recess, nor can the optional spare wheel, which if you specify it, will be mounted beneath the car where criminals might be tempted to try and steal it. Dacia decided to make these third row chairs of the removable sort, helpful for those who want to turn their jogger into some sort of removal van, but unhelpful for the brand's Euro NCAP safety test showing because it meant that those rearmost chairs couldn't be fitted with seatbelt warning lights, which lost the brand a crucial test result star. To remove the seats at 10 kilos each, they're actually quite light, there's a red pull tie on the right side of each chair base, tugging on which angles the whole seat forward. Then you simply unclip it at the front and take the thing out. But you're not going to want to do that all that often, more usually, you'll be pushing on these outermost red tabs, which folds the backrest forward onto its squab, though not quite flat. That's because Dacia needed to leave space beneath the car for the optional spare wheel and the LPG tank it offers on the car in some markets. As usual with seven-seaters, there are various seat-folding permutations. Dacia says up to 60 of them in this case, though we're not quite sure how they arrived at that figure. Anyway, folding the third row backrests forward frees up a useful 712 litres of space measured to the top of the backrest. If you were then to go on and fold the second row seats as well, you have up to 1,819 litres of space to play with. For really long items, it would have been nice if the second row bench folded 40-20-40 or featured a ski flap in the event it only folds in a conventional 60-40 split. It would have been even better if Dacia had included provision for a fold forward front passenger seat too, so that really lengthy items like kayaks or small ladders could have been accommodated but that's not possible either so for things like that you'll need to use the clever modular rack on the roof. Let's get straight to it the pricing proposition here is quite simply Astonishing. No matter how you try and pigeonhole this jogger's genre, estate, crossover, MPV, SUV, any other new model you could consider in any of these categories would be vastly more expensive. In fact, there's nothing properly family sized on the market of any kind that can get even remotely near this jogger's entry level asking price, which from launch was around £15,000 for the base essential version and certainly nothing with seven seats, provision of which would basically require you to double your spend. So if this jogger appeals, you might find yourself minded to spend a little more. From the launch of this car, £16,500 was enough to get the mid-range comfort spec model tested here and £17,400 was needed for top Extreme SE trim. In its own way, this kind of pricing is as eye-catching as the Dacia's £6,000 entry-level sticker price was on a Sandero when the brand launched in the UK back in 2013. Now, obviously, you'll pay a little more if you want this car in 1.6-litre hybrid form, but Dacia also said at the time of this test that it was developing a campervan version. Even at the budget end of the market, cars like this jogger are increasingly acquired through PCP finance deals rather than outright purchase. And should you be minded to consider financing options, the figures look equally affordable. For a base essential variant at the time of this test in summer 2022, you could put £196 down and pay £196 a month for the car over four years we'd suggest that you push the budget at least as far as this mid-range comfort spec, in which case the deposit rises to £215 
and it's £215 a month over the four years. If you stretch to top Extreme SE spec, it's £225 deposit and £225 a month. As we said, rivals to this car are basically non-existent. Not long ago, you could have turned to an MPV based on a small van, but Peugeot, Citroën and Vauxhall have reverted to full EV drivetrains for models like these, while Ford now bases its small van-based MPV contender, the Torneo Connect, on a pricier Volkswagen Caddy. Either way, you're looking at spending the best part of £30,000 on something like that with seven seats. For not a huge amount more than that, you could get a seven-seat MPV like a Skoda Kodiak or a Seat Taraco, or a mid-sized seven-seat MPV like Volkswagen's Turan. It's second-hand versions of cars like those that probably represent the closest match to the customer proposition we're faced with here. And if you don't want that, you might very well find yourself wanting a jogger in which case the deal might be sealed by a reasonable level of generosity on Datch's part when it comes to standard spec. Is that what's being offered here? Let's see. Starting with base essential spec, which includes more than you might expect for its bargain basement sticker figure, front fog lights, cruise control with speed limiter, rear parking sensors, automatic headlights, electric front windows, and a basic level of safety provision, and that's the subject we'll get onto in a few moments. Inside with an essential jogger, there's manual air conditioning and Datch's media control system that provides a bracket for your smartphone to function instead of a central infotainment screen. Moving up to this comfort trim level gets you a slightly smarter look thanks to body-coloured door handles, rear-tinted windows and 16-inch flex steel wheels that, although styled to replicate the appearance of alloy rims, are more robust and affordable should they need to be replaced. We'd be tempted to stretch to comfort spec to get these innovative modular roof rails, which can be transformed into a roof rack with a twist of a provided Allen key. And at this level in the range, you also get keyless entry, electrically adjustable and heated door mirrors, automatic wipers, front parking sensors and a reversing camera. With comfort trim, there's also much less of a Spartan feel to the jogger's interior, thanks to the addition of a soft-touch steering wheel, satin chrome interior door handles and satin chrome and copper orange air vents. It also helps that you get a proper central screen at this level, courtesy of Dacia's 8-inch media display system, which comes with two USB ports and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Other additions at this level include automatic climate-controlled air conditioning, an electric parking brake, a central armrest with storage, plus power for the rear windows and one-touch operation for those at the front. At the top of the range, Extreme SE spec gives you 16-inch alloy wheels in a black finish, black roof bars and door mirrors, plus additional exterior styling elements unique to the model. The interior, meanwhile, gains heated front seats, special floor and cargo mats, and Dacia's media nav system with built-in navigation and wireless smartphone mirroring. It would be nice if Dacia's customer-orientated price focus Remove the need to pay extra for your chosen paint colour, but sadly not. The only standard colour is opaque glacier white. If you don't want that, you'll need to pay around £600 extra for a metallic shade like this test car's iron blue. You'll also need to find £300 extra for a spare wheel. And Dacia offers four accessory options, all of which you might well want. A shark fin antenna, premium textile floor mats, a wireless smartphone charger, and an EasyFlex modular boot protector. But there had to be a catch somewhere, didn't there? If there is with this car, it lies in its safety performance. Euro NCAP gave it just a single star in its safety testing and gave Dacia a verbal dressing down for its safety standards afterwards. Since Dacia merely inherits Renault Engineering, this is part of a wider Renault-Nissan Alliance Group issue rather than specifically a Dacia one, but a few points need to be made here. Dacia's perspective is that Euro NCAP's testing and star ratings aren't necessarily based on real-world safety. 
and the company maintains that this is one of the safest cars it has ever made, pointing out that it's far safer than its previous seven-seaters, the Moroccan-built Logi and Docker MPVs, models we thankfully didn't get here, though that's not saying much. Undaunted, the brand has vowed to its critics that it won't pursue a policy of chasing safety stars that would dilute the exceptional value proposition of its products. So, who's right? And should you have any concerns in choosing one of these from a safety perspective? Well, the first point to make is that the one-star Euro NCAT rating is really a two-star one. The safety testers didn't actually crash a jogger, but based the result on that of a mechanically similar Dacia Sendero, then deducted the jogger a star because it isn't fitted with a seatbelt reminder function in the third row. Quite intentional, because the brand wanted the third row seats to be removable. The five-seat only jogger you can buy in Europe is a two-star Euro NCAT model, but a two-star NCAT rating still isn't very good, nor are the percentage ratings this model received for vulnerable road user protection at 41% and safety assist functions at 39%. And NCAP's observation that this car's side curtain airbag doesn't provide as much protection for those at the back as it might has some validity. From there onwards, though, the safety news gets better. The NCAP scores this jogger received for adult occupant safety at 70% and child occupant safety at 69% aren't terrible. And overall, these scores aren't very different from those a four- or five-year-old second-hand seven-seat SUV would get if it was tested today, say, a Kia Sorento or a Volkswagen Turan. We should also point out that although camera safety provision was inevitably limited here by this car's low asking price and the lane departure warning system you'd now find on most modern cars is lacking, all joggers do get Renault's AEBS or Automatic Emergency Braking System, which scans the road ahead as you drive and will automatically brake the car in the event of an impending impact. This mid-range comfort spec model adds a blind spot warning system too, which will flash a warning in the driver's mirror if you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle. Plus, of course, there are plenty of passive safety features. You get the usual front airbags, plus the side curtain airbags we mentioned, and isofix points are provided for the outer positions on the middle seating row, though not at the very back. An overhead SOS button references the GPS call system that will alert the emergency services with your exact location should the airbags go off. Plus, all joggers also get hill start assist, which holds the car in position if you're on a slope and take your foot off the brake, preventing it from rolling backwards. You'd have been delighted with all of that a decade ago. Things have moved on since, of course, but prices have spiralled too. Dacia here reckons it's managed to balance evolving safety provision with a sensible increment to the end customer. In many respects, we're minded to agree with them, and you might be too. Dacia isn't bothering with a diesel for this model, and at present, there's no sign of the Continental LPG version of this car's Renault-derived one-litre petrol unit being offered here. So, if you're buying on a budget, you'll need to like the idea of this jogger's three-cylinder TCE 110 engine in conventional form, which is what we've been trying here, and which records up to 49.6 mpg on the combined cycle, potentially giving quite a decent operating range from the 50 litre fuel tank. The CO2 reading is 132 grams per kilometre. As we mentioned in our driving section, the full hybrid 1.6 litre automatic variant wasn't yet on sale at the time of this test, but obviously it's going to be a good deal more frugal than that. Based on the return to this power plant in the similarly engineered Renault Clio, we'd expect close to 60 mpg on the combined cycle and a CO2 reading not too far over the 100 gram per kilometre mark. Impressive, but for most jogger folk, probably not quite impressive enough to justify the hybrid variant's likely price increment. 
So our focus here has been on the conventional one litre model, which we found gets pretty close to its maker's economy claims. Drive carefully and make regular use of the dash-mounted eco button that restricts engine power and tweaks the air conditioning to improve efficiency and you should manage 40 to 45 mpg on a regular basis. On that basis, this jogger would cost you just over £3,300 to fuel every 20,000 miles. Good going for a family-sized seven-seater. To give you some perspective, a more conventional seven-seat family SUV like a Kia Sorento would cost around £1,200 more to fuel over the same mileage. That's because SUVs have to carry around a lot more weight than Dacia can get away with here, over 70 kilograms in that Kia's case. As you might expect from a car in this price range, there are no aerodynamic tricks, though Dacia says it's work to optimise airflow. All versions of the Jogger get a basic trip computer as standard, which shows average and current MPG readouts, plus your driving range. Rather more helpful if your car has the 8-inch centre screen is the provided Driving Eco menu, which has three sections. Eco scoring scores your driving with marks out of five for acceleration, gear shift and anticipation, then giving you an overall score out of 100 designated by an Eco Leaf. There's a trip report option which gives you average consumption, average speed, distance without consumption, the latter being the distance you've travelled with the engine stop-start system working. Though we're not quite sure why you'd ever want to know that. Least useful is the eco coaching section, which only has four tips, most of which are blindingly self-evident. Things like drive at a steady speed and change up gears sooner. And one which merely promotes Dacia's oil partner, Castrol. Talking of oil, in terms of servicing, this is a relatively simple and relatively light car, so you can expect costs to be very reasonable. Service intervals for the three-cylinder engine are every year or every 12,000 miles. To help customers cover costs, Dacia offers service plans from around £10 per month, with three-year or 30,000 mile and four-year or 60,000 mile options available. When it comes to servicing, finding a workshop near to you shouldn't be an issue, as most Renault dealers also look after Dacia. It wasn't that long ago when the value of bargain-priced new cars fell as quickly as a piano from a building. Recently, though, Dacias have been bucking that trend, and this jogger is predicted to hold on to its value quite tenaciously, which is impressive given its low purchase price. Independent experts expect it to retain around 61% of its original value after a typical three years and 36,000 miles of ownership. That's outstanding. Better than some premium brand models, in fact. And it means that even if you go for a top-of-the-range Extreme SE one-litre variant, which cost around £18,000 at the time of this test, you should still get back around £11,000 after three years of motoring. The jogger's likely to be reliable too. Similarly engineered Dacias have always performed well in pan-European surveys. Perhaps not surprising for a brand that's sold in markets such as North Africa and South America, where roads meter out even more punishment than the UK's potholed streets. And the warranty? Well, it covers the jogger for a relatively standard three years and 60,000 miles, matched by roadside assistance for the same period and distance. But if you're looking to keep the car for longer or drive it further, the warranty can be extended via one of the brand's peace of mind add-ons. It's possible to extend the warranty by up to three further years and by as much as a further 40,000 miles or a combination of the two. Going for the maximum six years and 100,000 miles of cover will cost a few hundred pounds. Reassuring if you're planning on seeing more of the world, though still short of the standard seven-year warranty provided by affordable brands like Kia and MG. What else might you need to know? VED road tax? Well, essential and extreme SE versions are annually rated at £190. This mid-range comfort version, for some reason, costs slightly more at £240. Finally, insurance. The essential and comfort models are rated at Group 13E. For the top extreme SE variant, it's Group 14E. 
to give you some perspective on that, most mid-sized seven-seater SUVs, new or used, are rated somewhere between groups 22 and 30 upwards. Occasionally in this business, you get a really unexpectedly pleasant surprise. And that's what this car provides. We can't help thinking that the Jogger is Dacia's most appealing model to date. There's some of the practicality of a compact MPV for family trips, an extra seating row so the kids can bring friends home from school, and a bit of SUV vibe so you'll feel happy parking it at the gym. Yes, it's unremarkable inside, but the cabins of modern Dacias no longer shout budget brand so loudly. The astonishing sticker price does though, and remarkably few corners have been cut to achieve it. The cabin quality is okay, all of the kit you really need is available, and it's even quite cheery to drive. The only real question mark hangs over safety standards, which aren't as up to date as those of the alternative family models you'd need to pay twice as much for. Unless you bought them second hand, in which case the safety standards wouldn't be that much different to what you get here. Usually when a car tries to be all things to all people, it ends up being a compromised confection. Yet we can imagine a jogger suiting someone just fine who wanted a family estate or an MPV, or an SUV. There's everything you need here and nothing you don't. Dacia's usual mantra, but this time delivers from a product with a little more polish. In summary, the Jogger is in many ways just about everything a modern, affordable family station wagon ought to be. And if that's not enough of a recommendation for you, we're not quite sure what is. <laughs>